You are the universe making sense of itself. The stars, the earth, this dog are all made up of the same stuff. Unlike those things, however, we go to extreme measures in order to make sense of this stuff, the things that this stuff is made of, and the stuff we use in order to make sense of the things that this stuff makes. A recent article in Cognition Today highlights this incredible feature of human existence, sense-making. Carly Wyke, the theorist behind sense-making, argues that such a process is the ongoing retrospective development of plausible images that rationalize what people are doing. This is far from something new. Reaching back to Zunzi's observation that humans enjoy patterning the world we inhabit, we've been well aware of the fact that our cognition is far from a passive receiver of information. The very existence of the universe, at least in our definition, is in this sense participatory, reliant on our very own subjective manipulation and generation of the information we encounter. A more interesting issue is why we decide to participate at all. Do we even have a choice? Many researchers propose that sense-making is a fundamental motivation for humans. In order to survive, we need to try our very best to understand what's happening around us and, unfortunately, there is way too much going on for us to process. So we start generalizing, summarizing, stereotyping, and so forth until we have an image of the world that is a little less overwhelming to navigate. This preference for simplification over accuracy will inevitably lead to some errors. For example, you might have at one point come across a headline discussing the possibility that drinking milk is linked to cancer. You want to be healthier and think to yourself a healthy person would not drink milk knowing this. You stop buying milk at the grocery store. Then, at a restaurant with a friend, you notice that he has erroneously ordered this cancerous elixir of death. You are quick to point out his mistake only to be then lectured on the nutritional benefits of milk. This heated moment devolves into an Old West style Google showdown. You type why milk is bad for you, and your friend types why milk is good for you. Each of you receives what you were looking for. An argument over sources and study sizes finally ends in a harrowing conclusion. Milk is good and bad, there is no objective truth, morality is meaningless, and the universe is a cold prison of chaotic disorder. This is, of course, confirmation bias, the fact that we will only search for information that readily coincides with our pre-existing beliefs. This creates a misinformation snowball since we can only increase the chances of reinforcing our own views. After all, why spend hours researching the health effects of dairy when you can construct a simple rule of thumb based off of minimal information? Areas of nutrition, investment, and dating are fairly innocent but nonetheless welcoming areas of uncertainty where there are few written rules and, conversely, a plethora of old wives' tales, unfounded tips, and straight-up superstitions. Consequently, these areas are where sense-making can present us with its greatest flaw, making up conclusions just to tamper our fears of disorder. However, no area is inflicted with more uncertainty than that of our very own existence. How do we make sense of us even being alive? When confronted by such an issue, sense-making transforms into meaning-making, a process that attempts to make sense of the now and the future in ways it gives you purpose and a desirable existential context. This is evident when one follows a certain religion, commits an act of love, or engages in a lifelong project. We interpret our time spent here as a vessel for some result, cause, or purpose, in turn giving ourselves a reason to exist. Maitlis and Christensen combine meaning-making and sense-making in their own idea of the sense-making process. For them, it's a process prompted by violated expectations that involves attending to and bracketing cues in the environment, creating intersubjective meaning through cycles of interpretation and action, and thereby enacting a more ordered environment from which further cues can be drawn. For them, sense-making usually requires a confusing situation, a labeling of such situation, other people to seal it with authenticity, and a holistic assignment of purpose through highlighting the important information and providing context. It should be noted that the desire for sense-making usually emerges from two seemingly opposing states, curiosity and boredom. In curiosity, we see knowledge as a reward and propel ourselves towards it. In boredom, we feel the absence of sense-making and propel ourselves as far as possible from such a state of meaninglessness. Ideally, if one wishes to live in a constant zest for life beyond curiosity and boredom, one should embrace a state of flow, an intense state of concentration and involvement with some activity with the highest levels of sense and meaning. This could be found in everyday hobbies, important projects, or engaging conversation. Flow is the state in which meaning-making, in the existential sense, and sense-making, in the cognitive sense, unite. 
we feel the reward as we are engaged, and, upon reflection, sense ourselves as, at one point, belonging to a state of higher engagement with a universe that we are part of. Through a vital engagement in intrinsically rewarding activities, we can once again gain momentary insights into the fact that we are the universe making sense of itself. Mm -hmm.